If you would like to support the channel, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. More information in the description below. Alan Wake went into Cauldron Lake to save his wife, and 13 years later, she would do the same for him because he was never able to escape the dark place. He was trying to write himself out of it, but he never got it right. Wake knew that for a story to work, it had to follow rules. It had to be organic, it had to make sense. No hero armor, no contrivances, no cheat codes, so to speak. He believed that he had to create a story that allowed him to escape without bringing the Dark Presence with him. The Dark Presence was a brutal adversary to the writer, a foe that countered and matched his creative endeavors at every step. It could break and control a person by exploiting their fears and their weaknesses, and while many were claimed as victims of the Dark Presence, Alan wasn't, at least he wasn't killed. The Shadow needed Wake to write it out into the world, and it enacted this desire via a being called Mr. Scratch. Think of Mr. Scratch as the representative of the Dark Place, a creation of the Dark Place, and the literal Dark Place. Mr. Scratch is every negative story, rumor, belief, and emotion about Alan Wake put into one being. And it's not just the negativity of those who knew Alan, the negativity of every person who knew his name. Truth didn't matter, intention didn't matter. Mr. Scratch was everything wrong or evil about the writer, put into a form that the Dark Place was all too happy to create. When you think about the charisma or the rage of Mr. Scratch, remember where those things come from. Because the Dark Place itself doesn't have emotion. They're the emotion and thoughts of the collective unconscious. Mr. Scratch is our fault. Mr. Scratch is your fault. Over the years, the Dark Place, or rather the fiction that Wake's writings created within it, changed it greatly. What Alan Wake wrote within the Dark Place couldn't change the world outside of it. He could only influence it, nudge it, imply to change things. But within the Dark Place itself, that was very much not the case. Where Alan was trapped was a product of himself. He was a powerful para-utilitarian, and he could absolutely alter the reality of the Dark Place. When Alan first entered back in 2010 after he had saved Alice, it was a swirling vortex of nothing. Just Alan and his writer's room, where he would create his drafts, put together storyboards, do his edits, perform rewrites. Time and time again, Alan created his stories, enacted them, failed to succeed and escape, and went back for rewrites. In one such story, one that became very important, written in 2012, Alan wrote himself into a strange night spring story in Arizona. When he was younger, Alan had been a writer for the show Night Springs, so the plot of the Champion of Light combating the Herald of Darkness was one familiar to him. He integrated it into his story writing, with him being the Champion of Light and Mr. Scratch being the Herald of Darkness. In this strange Night Springs story, Mr. Scratch tormented and taunted him. In such early stories, Alan's writing seemed a bit tropey, with lifeless characters, an over-the-top villain, vapid and stereotyped damsels in distress, and small world settings that were very easy to keep track of. What made this particular series of drafts so important is Mr. Scratch got a little bit too involved, and Alan destroyed his physical body, so to speak, just like he'd done to Barbara Jagger. But that didn't destroy Scratch himself. The rumors and stories about the evil Alan Wake in the real world persisted on, therefore Scratch did as well. It would just need a new body in order to escape. The Dark Presence, Scratch, could still take form within the Dark Place to interact with and manipulate Alan, but to actually leave, it would need another vehicle, and it would need Alan Wake to create that possibility. It seemed that as the years dragged on, in the real world at least, Alan's mental state deteriorated. The Dark Place fed off of his ego, his anger, his destructive tendencies, and eventually Alan started forgetting things, forgetting what he'd written, how he'd gotten wherever he was, what he was doing. His emotions started going wild, extreme, and constant fluctuations between anger, fear, mania, confusion, panic. It was torture and there was no escaping it. There was no reprieve to be had in the Dark Place. Imagine being trapped someplace with no concept of time where a moment might feel like a hundred years, yet you can't remember any of it. That Alan Wake was able to hold on to any semblance of sanity was remarkable. Because time loops and bends in on itself in the dark place, we can treat all plot points in Alan Wake's work as a beginning, a middle, and an end. Looking at the greater picture, it all works out, but the details muddy the fiction. For 13 years, Alan wrote and edited and rewrote and scrapped ideas, threw out entire plots and characters, created new ones, Hell, it was possible for two of the same Alan to exist in the same place from different points in the story. It was an ongoing, constant process. So we are going to choose a plot point within his current project, but that's just because it will give us a clean beginning, and then we'll go from there. That doesn't mean that it's what Alan Wake wrote first as an opener, it's just a spot for us to start. 
Now, we're not going to rehash the events that took place in 2019 with the Federal Bureau of Control and the Hiss invasion. Instead, we're going to stay in the dark place and set up our last character before our story starts. Let's chat a little bit about a strange character within the dark place, Tom Zane. Now, here's the thing. We know that when Alan went into the lake in 2010, the man called Tom the Poet was a saving grace and a guide to Alan. Alan wrote him into the story to be that, and what remained of Tom Zane the Poet was able to appear to help Alan. He safeguarded the clicker, spread around Wake's manuscript pages, guided him as a bright presence amid the darkness. But Zane was not a god, and Wake is not a god. After the 2010 AWE, Tom Zane the Poet just kind of ceased. Hopefully he was able to find a happy ending, to finish his own story, go find Barbara, go away with her someplace to exist beyond our world. But the Tom Zane that was appearing within the dark place wasn't Tom Zane the poet, it was Tom Zane the filmmaker. It's impossible to know what Zane really is, but I'm going to treat Tom Zane the filmmaker as a creation of the dark place, like Mr. Scratch was to Wick. Two sides of the same coin, but very different beings. Rather than distinguish between Tom the Poet and Tom the Filmmaker, I'm going to just call him Tom Zane from here on out. This being also desires to get out of the dark place, just like Mr. Scratch did. And he knows that his only way out, or rather, currently his only way out, is through Wake writing him into the story. But let's tell a little story about Zane and Scratch. For some time, Alan had stopped trying to get out. He stopped writing. He realized that he was hurting people, and he wanted to just stop. A loop. I have to stop. Stop running. Stop writing. I won't write another word. It's too dangerous. Only horror comes out of it. People get hurt. I will let the currents of this ocean wash me away. But what if I forget why I stopped? What if I forget I stopped it? All that is fucked up. If that happens, I'll start writing again. So when Scratch went to Zane to scheme a plot for both of them to get out, Zane jumped at the opportunity. He would create a movie, and please excuse my attempt at saying this, You and You, to accompany the writings of Scratch slash Alan. It would be two artists working in collaboration to create a masterpiece. Scratch wrote a complete manuscript called Return, but the thing about that piece of writing is that it was piggybacking off of a piece of work that Alan Wake had already started. And Alan Wake followed very strict rules in regards to his writings. Return was the finale of a trilogy, and the second book didn't exist yet. Alan Wake himself would need to write it. The book Return ended with the Dark Presence escaping out into Bright Falls, and Alan Wake himself had no memory of Scratch doing this. Now, we can't really say one fateful day when it comes to the Dark Place, so one fateful point in time in a place where time and concepts of reality don't really exist and dream logic is king, Wake observed a strange being walking through his Dark Place universe. He didn't know his name, didn't know what he was, but it was Mr. Warland Dorr. And Dor allowed Alan to observe him. Dor allowed Alan to write him into his fiction. Dor existed outside the control of Alan Wake's writings, and perhaps knowing what was to come and who was soon going to be a part of this cycle, Dor humored Alan. A small part of Alan's writings, just a few sentences in fact, would be written about something that Dor does, and that would serve as directions that Saga Anderson would need in the future, during the final draft of this tale. And through it, a link to connect with Warland Dor himself when the time was right via her mind place. But that's a connection and a payoff that will come much, much later. Time means nothing. Order of operations has been muddied and broken, so let's start here. Alan Wake wakes up on a couch. We are now in the spiral. And at some point in this spiral, Alan Wake was shot in the head, and he instinctively puts his fingers up to the bullet wound. But while it's already happened, it also hasn't yet happened, and he doesn't really remember it happening. Take my hand, it's gonna get weird, but this is a solid spot to begin the storytelling. Currently, he is backstage on a TV set, in between with Mr. Door, a creation of Alan Wake's mind to keep him anchored to something familiar. But remember, Warland Door is not influenced by his writings. He's here because he chooses to be. He's playing a part because he chooses to. Alan gets to the stage via a television, with no clue as to where he is or why he's here. But Mr. Door greets him at the curtain and thus begins their interview. Warlin asks Wake about his new book, the sequel to Departure. Departure was what Alan wrote 13 years prior, when Alice was taken by the Dark Presence. Door pulls out a book. It's called Initiation. It's the second in a trilogy, but Alan has no idea what this is. He never wrote a book called Initiation, and he would remember if he wrote a book, right? To which Door very coyly jokes, maybe it was written by your evil double. 
Dor plays his part in this ever agitating loop that Alan is in and tells him what initiation is. It's the story of a writer trapped in a nightmare trying to find the manuscript of a novel that he's forgotten he's written. It's sort of the exact situation that he's in now, isn't it? He will be tormented by his dark doppelganger and guided by visions of a fictional detective, Alex Casey. Not the real world Alex Casey, but what Alan created in his books. So as laid out by this late night host, here's what Alan must do. Find his writer's room, project himself out into the dark version of New York City that he's created, and write until he finds a complete story that will work. It will take a few drafts, and each draft will retain pieces of the overall story. It will all matter, and in fact, in another part of the spiral, Alan is already in the writer's room, writing all of what they're doing right now as they speak. Remember, time doesn't follow any rules here, and it doesn't play fair. This is just one plot point that's a convenient starting place, and this loop has potentially been repeating dozens, hundreds, thousands of times over at this point. So this is Alan's first memory of being here, but he's also been here before. And he knows that he needs to start writing his book, but at the same time, he's already been writing in another part of the spiral. Dor isn't exactly happy to be here. The only reason he is, is because Wake has, slash is going to write somebody into the story that he cares about, Saga Anderson. For now, he will help. But his next to godly patience is wearing thin with Alan. He alludes to a third book already being created, a book called Return. And wouldn't it just be so meta if he vanished right after this interview ended? Well, a few moments later, Alan wakes up on the set alone in the dark with only a vague idea of what to do. Checking through the backstage, he finds a video of himself in the writer's room at another point in the spiral. Impossible to say if it's in the past or the future because that's a vague concept here. He'll find these tapes often and they're never fun to view. He's often distressed, talking nonsense, but there are hints and clues about what's going on hidden amongst the panic. Before Alan is able to get out of the building, Scratch attacks. The writer doesn't know that Scratch is able to use him at opportune times, enter his body, take over the driver's seat, so to speak. It will only occur during moments of extreme weakness, but when it does happen, it's just a blackout for him. When he comes back to his senses, he's in the writer's room, where he's actually physically been the whole time. What had happened with that interview and him walking around the backstage, it was Alan projecting himself into his writings, projecting himself into a draft. Think of it like Alan Wake being on a holodeck in Star Trek. He's seeing if his story works. But being back in the writer's room already, his memory is full of holes. Much like Saga's Mind Place, Alan's writer's room will hold on to notes and collected items throughout his current loop. But it's also an inverse to Saga's Mind Place. Saga goes into her Mind Place mentally and carries out her adventure physically in the real world, whereas Alan stays in his writer's room physically and carries out his adventures mentally, or astrally within the reality that he creates within the Dark Place. You know what I mean. Dor had mentioned Alex Casey guiding him in the book Initiation. Alan Wake is very familiar with the Alex Casey series. After all, he wrote them. So why not make it a detective noir? Why not create an Alex Casey book and then usurp his role in it? His story would begin back on that stage, back with that interview. But this time, it would be a little bit different. Initiation Draft 1 He's a bit more aware this time, more involved with the interview than before. Beside him is an actor that will play Alex Casey in an apparent film adaptation being developed. While Alan is thrilled with the actor's choice because he looks just like Casey, he's not happy with the creative liberties taken with the source material. He wasn't involved in the project, so he didn't have much of a say. The character Alex Casey is supposed to be a guide of sorts for Alan. They play a clip from the upcoming film, and the character says something about a table lamp shaped like an angel being the only thing that will shed light on a mystery. You know, he caught the important parts, something about a writer, something about a lamp. Then, scene change again, back in the dark on the TV set. He walks around the backstage much the same as his first time through, but this time Scratch does not impede his progress. In the lounging room, the sweet humming of a familiar voice flows from the janitor's closet, someone quite familiar with Alan. Let's take a second to talk about the janitor, Audie. Audie showed up at the oldest house a long time ago. In fact, his designation is Entity A001. Early 1960s is the most likely time frame. Once upon a time, some researchers tried to study Audie. They filmed him and inadvertently made a pretty scary altered item in the process. And the order came from then on to just leave Audie alone for God's sake. 
Adi is and always has served specifically as a janitor. He cleans, he keeps things working, he tends to imbalance. He's a helper. But at the end of the day, Adi is a paranatural entity, one whose motivations aren't really understood. Adi enjoyed vacationing at Watery, a little tiny hamlet near Bright Falls, very close to Cauldron Lake. It could be because of a combination of Finnish culture there, feeling at home and welcome, enjoying the scenery and the people. But it's more likely that he vacations there to keep an eye on the lake. Sometime after the 2019 Hiss invasion ended, Adi went to Watery on vacation and didn't come back. Most likely, Adi did what Adi does. He cleaned, he kept balance, he started helping, kept being a janitor kept stealing some guy's jumpsuit to look the part, integrated into Watery, and kept an eye on the black stuff. Alan asks Adi if he can help him find the exit, and of course he can. Adi is here to help. He keeps calling him Tom, and Alan corrects him, to which Adi replies yes, of course, but also Tom is part of Alan, somehow. Alan is a man with tools, and a man with tools can build his own exit. The tools that he'll need are in a shoebox, yes, that shoebox, in the basement where Alan himself left it. Adi has comforting words for Alan should he wish to hear them, and as confusing as they are, they're also illuminating. Adi wants him to succeed, to get the lights back on, and when Alan needs help, there are helpers who will aid him on the way. In the basement is indeed a shoebox with a lamp, just like Adi said. This is the very lamp that the clicker itself was cut from. The lamp will allow Alan to bring light to dark places, to carry it with him, to transfer it, to solve puzzles by changing the world around him, letting him make a way forward. As he wrote, the light carved out something new from the darkness. But the lamp being here is kind of a big bummer for later in the story. Cynthia Weaver had kept that lamp for all these years. It was one of the last things that she had left of the real Tom Zane, whom she had a big crush on when she was younger. She was Tom Zane's Lady of the Light, and she relied on that lamp to keep her safe from the dark presence in her old age. And it's here now because, well... Rose Marigold stole it from Cynthia and threw it into an overlap for Alan because she was directed to do so, which causes all kinds of sad problems for poor Cynthia Weaver later. Before leaving, Alan has to change the light in the exit area, which forces him to confront a video of himself during his writings. He's talking about the clicker. He lost it. It was sent back to the real world, now in the possession of the Koskala brothers and the Cult of the Tree. He doesn't know that it's there now, though. He writes about the clicker being cut from this very lamp. It will be his weapon against the darkness now. It sounds like he's rambling, but in truth, it's almost lucid. Outside the studio, a payphone is ringing. It's what draws his attention once he's in the streets. This dark version of a warped New York City is covered in pieces of himself. Graffiti about Scratch and Alice, streets and even buildings named after people and places familiar to him, billboards all about his IPs and himself, even the license plates on the cars are giving him messages. The person on the phone is Zane, the filmmaker, but Alan has no idea who they are. He doesn't remember or know what he's written or is writing, yet it gives him a sense of deja vu. Zane directs him to the subway at the Caldera Street Station. He promises that he's there to help Alan, and that they've been working together on something, but the call is cut short before more plot can be revealed. Ooh, such tension. Conveniently, there's a subway pass on the ground right in front of him, and I'd be curious to know how many times he had to go looking for it in past stories before he just wrote it to be in front of him there. But his way into the station isn't very straightforward. He needs light. He needs to obtain charges for the lamp. A bright light down an alley guides him towards just such a thing. But as Warlandor had said during the interview, someone else will help Alan along the way. A character from his work of fiction, Detective Alex Casey. The man Alan had met during the interview was the actor who played Casey in an upcoming film, but this is the real, fictional character. It confuses Alan, though, meeting one of his own characters face to face. He doesn't remember that he wrote all of this, so it feels surreal. Imagine writing a story all your own and then the main character just walks up to you in real life, talking about the plot of a book that you have no idea that you're currently writing. Alan hears Casey's words in a way very similar to how Saga interrogates via her mind place. Though, what he gets is more like a story being told via Alex Casey's insights. It's far less hands-on than Saga's technique. Casey tells Alan of manuscript pages detailing a murder carried out by a cult. And he had suspicions that Alan Wake was the leader. Ooh, so very interesting. Casey is not here to be a friend or an ally to Wake, but neither is he a foe. When the lights go out down the alley and a presence is felt, Casey tells Alan to stay back while he investigates. He bravely confronts some unseen entity in the darkness, shooting into something that screams and howls in the night, and then, quiet. 
Wake finds Alex Casey dying with only a flashlight illuminating the scene. The fading man's thoughts echo around like an internal dialogue for other characters to hear. He remembers dying here before like he's experienced this on a loop. Wake kept killing him, writing it to be over and over and over again. His final words are those of anger towards the writer and a promise that he's going to get what's coming to him. Alan takes Casey's flashlight and gun. He is now assuming the detective's role in the story. He's taken the place of Alex Casey in this mystery horror novel. And now that he's equipped, it's a fitting time in the story for the dark presence to become more aggressive. The hero must fight against the forces of evil to reach his next objective. At the train station entrance, he finds that he needs another charge in his lamp, so he takes another route to search for more to take up with him. Up the fire escapes and walkways of surrounding buildings, Alan finds echoes of Alex Casey's stories. The thoughts and feelings of this fictional man will help define the places that Alan will walk. It's a rough and tumble city, made up of sins and trauma befitting people who thrive on danger. A modern noir made real all around him. But there's someone outside the noir that's been, well, placed here. Alan hears humming at first, which guides him to a safe room where Sheriff Tim Breaker is hanging out. And he recognizes Alan, they've met before in previous loops. Tim remembers things far better than Alan does because he's not really a part of the story. He is a real person, not a work of fiction, here because of Warlandor's intervention in Saga's journey. He's been taking notes on the place, trying to piece together a way out, putting together a map of the ever-changing reality, just whatever he can do to stay active. Who knows how long he's felt like he's been here or how many times he's met Alan. He has supplies if Alan needs them, little bits of insights and info, and he's just a pleasant person to talk to. That Wake calls Warlandor a talk show host is almost funny to Tim. He says that the guy has a lot of disguises, but a talk show host? Nah. Al finds the lights that he needs to get through the subway, and then the fun begins. According to the story of Alex Casey, somewhere down here is an FBI agent that was ritualistically murdered by the cult that he had been hunting. And that's good, that's a good spicy story, one that Alan could use for initiation. Remember, Alan is projecting himself here into the story. His physical body is in the writer's room, crafting the tale that he is also experiencing. It has to be organic, make sense, follow rules. If he comes across something that doesn't quite fit, or if he feels inspired by the echoes of Alex Casey, he'll need to go back to his storyboard in the writer's room and make changes. The missing FBI agent story is a good one. It makes sense, and it has narrative validity for him to be down here. So he goes to his storyboard, changes the plot element to match the missing FBI narrative, and the world around him changes to match it. The next block that he has comes at a collapsed tunnel. He's been going down empty tunnels and broken cars for a while. It's time to change it up. The next echo is of two NYPD officers, reminiscent of the real-life deputies Mulligan and Thornton in Bright Falls. The NYPD officers are talking about the dangers of the cult, how anyone who tries to find them ends up dead. And then another echo, Alex Casey talking to a professor who tells him about the cult of the word. The professor is in the image of Tammy Booker, the woman who went to Bright Falls to write a true crime novel about Alan Wake. In this fictional version, she's telling Casey about how the tunnels were used for ritual sacrifices taken straight from Alan Wake's own writings. In the story, Alan was involved, but under a false identity, he was called Mr. Scratch. Even Alan admits that involving himself in the story like this was a bit disturbing, but it felt correct and he was desperate. It's a new plot element that he can use to change the scene, to move deeper into the tunnels. It takes him to a derailed train and something here had to have happened. Something terrible, what could it be? He places one of the plot elements into the scene, that of the murder cult, and devises that this is where the cult of the word tracked down their foes, the torchbearers. The evil cult cornered the torchbearers, put them into an abandoned train car, and set it on fire. It gives him a new plot element that will perfectly allow him to move through the train cars blocking the path. Alan finds an area that would be a perfect setting for the next part of the draft. It's an open hall that could tell a story. He loads in different plot elements to change the area finding little bits of reality imprinted into it, like a recording of Robert Nightingale's panicked voice hidden in a booth. At another plot element, chairs circle a spot where something violent happened. It's starting to look more like a ritual site than a subway hall. There are shackles on the barriers and blood spatter all over the floors. At the next plot element, the hall is a full-fledged cult hideout, decorated with an altar and pews. An echo of Alex Casey even has the hardened detective admitting that this cult was tampering with things that it shouldn't be tampering with, as though this was something supernatural. It inspires one more plot element, a summoning ritual. 
In this scene, the cultists chant a terrible poem to bring forth their deity. This is the ritual to lead you on. Your friends will meet him when you're gone. Those lines will be used in Alan's story many times. They will and have appeared in the manuscript pages sent to Saga Anderson. With this final, integral plot element, Alan goes back to that collapsed tunnel earlier in the journey, and he loads it in. The tunnel opens up, it's his way out, and now is the perfect time for the enemy to attack. The dark presence comes after him. Something is beyond this tunnel that it, that Scratch, does not want him to interact with. But the rules of the story stand. The dark presence cannot reach him in the light. He takes shelter in a bright room for a moment, and when the screams of Scratch fades, he runs back through the tunnel with Scratch hot on his heels. The destructive forces of Scratch bring down parts of the ceiling, putting some space between the two, just in time. What is beyond the tunnel is an overlap. In his fiction, it's the cult murder site of an FBI agent, but in the real world, it's overlapping with the forests where Saga wandered while hunting Nightingale alone. Nightingale's corpse is here, as is his heart. When Wick gets close, it vanishes. It's needed in the real world, put into that fridge where Saga will find it. It's her key to opening the overlap. Remember, the flow of time here is different from reality. What takes a great deal of time in the real world might just be a few moments for Alan, and vice versa. Just a few seconds later, he turns and he meets Saga Anderson. In the time that it took for him to turn around, she found the heart, opened the overlap, went through the loops, and put down Nightingale. They learn each other's names, share their disjointed information of danger and warning, and for Saga Anderson, at the conclusion of this conversation, she exits the overlap and stands on the shores of Cauldron Lake. She's there for only a few moments before an anomaly occurs and a man appears on the beach. It's Alan himself returned to the world via a ritual that has not yet been carried out by Saga herself. This meeting in this overlap is how he learns of Saga. The manuscript pages for the book Return that she's found with her name edited into them are going to be written within the dark place by Alan, but the bending and broken timeline of Alan's world dictate that it's both going to happen and it already has happened. He's going to write her into the story, but she's already been written into the story. And if that doesn't make sense, it's okay. How we perceive time and reality is a luxury and a sanity that Alan Wake doesn't have. If we were to jump back and forth between Alan and Saga's stories, it would be like trying to fit a square block into a triangle hole. It doesn't really work that way. There's no way to gracefully overlap them. It gets very, very messy. So what we're going to do is for the time being, we're going to stay with Alan Wake, we're going to explain the adventure he goes through, and then we're going to apply it to Saga's A to B timeline. So we'll see you soon, Saga. Let's go back to the dark place. The completion of this part of the draft changes something outside the tunnel. Where he once lived with Alice, a huge building called Parliament Tower, appears within the story. This is where the finale of the story will take place. It's where it will always take place. He needs to get there to see how the story should end. Exiting the station, it's hard to ignore the looming structure that was once his home. It feels strange to him to feel so close to being home in this place. That payphone is ringing again, taking his focus away from the goal. It's the same voice as before, who we know to be Zane. He asks Wake if he's been to the overlap, and he's thrilled to learn that Alan did make it there. This is progress for them. Zane uses Alice to motivate him to the tower, asking if he's sure that she really got out of the dark place. The call ends with a vague warning from Zane. The dark place can manifest as his evil double, Scratch. An echo of Alex Casey is in the lobby of the building. According to him, Alice Wake went on to create art that alluded to her late husband. She knew things. She was crying for help. She was in danger, and nothing would get Alan moving or motivated faster than Alice's well-being. As soon as the elevator door opens, camera flashes go off, and Scratch starts to hound him. He recognizes this as Alice's equipment, and trouble presents as soon as he enters the home. There's a crash of silverware and glass, then Alice's voice ordering somebody to get out and leave her alone, but she is nowhere to be seen. Alice Wake, the real Alice Wake, the woman who plunged back into the dark place to save her husband, she controls this place. This was all set up by her to guide and nudge Alan along, down what will ultimately prove to be a painful and dangerous path. Her photos are scattered all around, taken in the real world and brought here as tools. She had been touched by the dark place back in 2010. She was a conduit for it. When the terrible hauntings began in about 2017, she sought aid with the Federal Bureau of Control, and somehow she went on to remember everything. When she regained her memories of her time in the dark place, she began planning for a way to help Alan escape the loop that he was in. She was here to guide him on to ascension, but doing that would require heartache. Alan had to understand her torment for this to work. 
he needed to see her. There's a memory card and a video camera in the living area. It's Alice, talking about her younger years, her love of photography, her relationship with Alan, understanding that her passion wasn't the source of their success, then Alan's writer's block and their trip to Bright Falls. She didn't tell him the truth behind it. They fought, things somehow went wrong, and then he was just gone. She blames herself sometimes. Six years prior to this, she began hearing Alan's voice in their home at night, hearing typewriter clacking. She knew that it was him haunting her, and it became violent. He was a monster. He oh, always did have anger in him. She's curating her story to fit what Alan needs to hear. She says that she set up cameras to capture these hauntings so that she could turn this art into a new exhibition, which she was going to call The Dark Place. Like he did with the television set back at the TV studio, Alan uses the film projector to teleport himself to another place in the story, a different part of the story's spiral. He returns to the writer's room to find himself with a bullet hole in his head. On the desk is the complete manuscript for a book called Return, with scribbles and handwritten edits. He has no memory of writing this manuscript because he didn't write it. Scratch did while controlling his body, and he has no memory of making the edits because he hasn't done it yet. He doesn't belong here. The story didn't work. Initiation isn't complete. Once again, he has failed. He has to go back and try again. Scratch the Dark Presence takes him over in this time of confusion and weakness, and he blacks out. When Alan snaps back awake, he's alone in the writer's room, sitting in front of his typewriter, aware that he failed to make his escape. The Dark Presence stopped him. So, time to start writing for draft two. It has to maintain some story elements from before, the ones that really worked well as a foundation, but the details need to change. He would need to get back to Parliament Tower in the end to save Alice from scratch, but he would use a different murder site this time. He begins drafting, remembering bits and pieces of previous spirals, his constant rewriting, scratch taking over, times where he lost his mind, being shot in the head, a strange light hole in his forehead, and then he projects himself into the writing. He'll start back at that TV station again, but this time it, it won't be an interview, at least not in the same way. He wakes up, touches his forehead to feel for that bullet wound that he's not yet experienced, and then begins taking in the scene around him. Warlin Dorr is speaking over the television, introducing the segment that Wake is about to be a part of. It won't just be any interview. What is to come is called The Story of the Journey of Alan Wake the Musical, or simply We Sing. And what's to follow is 20 minutes of the greatest content ever created, but alas, we can't spend that long savoring it. However, the song played here, Herald of Darkness, it does serve a purpose in Alan's journey. Every line from Dor, Alan himself, and the old gods of Asgard is a reminder to Alan of the life that he's lived, the road that he's walked that brought him here, and what his ultimate goal is. It touches on the power of the clicker, that the Herald of Darkness is within the Champion of Light, him and Scratch intertwined, he must search out a manuscript that holds the key to ending the vicious cycle that he's within, a loop that will repeat again and again until he finds a way out. Not a line of the song is wasted. And if there's anyone in these stories that can be trusted to tell the truth, it's the old gods of Asgard. By the time Alan is through this gauntlet of rock and roll and combat, he's fully re-equipped to handle the dark place and all the forces within it. And all too soon, it's over. Alan wakes up back in that dark station with the humming of Adi not far away. He's, you know, mopping the floor, it looks like, but Adi does what Adi needs to do, so who are we to question it? Exiting the studio, he has no idea what he's supposed to do next, but as with the previous draft, a payphone starts ringing just up the street. Of course, it's Tom Zane again. This time, this loop, Alan remembers the previous one. He remembers talking to this man before going into the subways, and that's startling for Zane. Alan actually remembers talking to him before. Alan tells this mystery man about what he found at Parliament Tower, that he believes Alice is in danger, and that there's another manuscript somewhere called Return that he saw the title page of, but he doesn't remember writing it. He's writing a book called Initiation, not Return. Zane knows who really wrote Return, and Zane wants Alan to go get that manuscript. He believes that they can use it to get out of the dark place, and Zane really wants out. I wouldn't trust this guy as far as I could dropkick him. He's cut from the same cloth as Mr. Scratch he is. And once upon a time, Mr. Scratch was a very charismatic being, though in an entirely different way. But Alan doesn't have much of a choice when it comes to guidance. The voice tells Alan to find him at the Ocean View Hotel. Yes, named after that Ocean View Motel and Casino, the place of power connected to the oldest house. 
Zane left him a key right there on the counter next to the phone. How convenient. It's not as easy as just walking through, though. Dream logic and all that. He has to follow neon lights down a dark alley where Alex Casey once again appears. This time, he's not nearly as calm. He tells Alan that he is the killer, the cult leader, the one responsible for all of this. Alan claims that it's Scratch, it's not him, and their struggle ends in Wake shooting Casey. In his dying thoughts, Alex Casey laments the dark place that has been within him for so long. It was all he knew at this point, so much part of himself that he couldn't remember what it was like to not be in pain. He knew that he wasn't in the dark place, he was the dark place, a vessel for it. And this line in the story will have very real repercussions in the real world, where the FBI agent Alex Casey lives on. The way into the Ocean View Hotel is up a nearby building and across a sky bridge. Alan enters on one of the top floors, which takes him directly to room 665. Within is a film projector, and through it, Alan is taken to another place within the hotel. Dream logic, you know. The hotel is different now. He's outside of room 665, and inside isn't just a projector, it's fully furnished to the point of being cluttered. And standing on the bed, being a bit of a drama lord, is the one called Zane. After a bit of poetry, he introduces himself properly to Wake. Alan knows Thomas Zane as a poet, the diver. This isn't really what he had imagined Tom to be. Why does Zane look like him? But Zane pushes back. Maybe Wake looks like him. Then the odd man corrects Alan, telling the writer that he is a filmmaker and that the poet was just a character that he created for his movie. Tom is a sharp contrast to Alan's all-business attitude. He easily smiles and expresses joy, even if it is a little bit off-putting. There's something beneath the surface of this being that isn't quite right. Zane claims that they had been collaborating to create a way out for both of them. Wake writing Return, Zane making an accompanying film. Tom knows that Alan didn't write Return. Tom knows that Scratch did it through Alan. Scratch didn't play nice in the end, and he excluded Zane's escape from the manuscript. But if Zane can manipulate Wake into getting the manuscript, then maybe he can still get out. Either way, the Dark Presence, the Shadow, it wins. Via Scratch, via Zane, either of them getting out into the real world could potentially be a disaster. Alan remembers a bit of their collaboration time, which is more like a long bender of drugs and alcohol. Doesn't really seem like much fun. The smartest thing that comes out of them is, it's return, because we return. Wow, how amazing and insightful. And there's an overlay of an Alma beer advertisement during the montage that's been bothering the hell out of me. So is someone smarter than me, do you know what the deal with that is? Back to their conversation though. Wake is already tired of Zane's caginess. His focus is Alice's safety, but Zane says it's fine. Alice is back in New York, she's safe, which is an absolute boldface lie. But the evil Scratch is searching for her via an overlap, so they need to get returned so that they can get out and Alan can go save her. There's another murder site here in the hotel. Surely whatever is within the hotel will inspire Alan to create a better draft of initiation. The intrusion of FBC director Jesse Faden on the TV interrupts their meeting. Zane seems to be a bit familiar with whoever they are, and he doesn't want them to find him. A lot has been going on outside of the lake recently, so of course the FBC and its director are going to be zoning in on the area. This ends their talk, and Alan is sent back to the projector in the empty room 665. There is a murder site that he needs to find, and a story that needs crafted. The words of Alex Casey guide him through the start of the tale. This place was used by a theater troupe as a site for a play featuring a murder cult. Alan admits that this place is the perfect setting for an Alex Casey novel. In the lobby, he finds an echo of Casey talking to the troop leader, a fictional version of Ed Booker. This play is supposed to be an immersive experience for all within the hotel. Different events in varying rooms, the audience gets to participate, telling the story of a cult. It's an older play, but the manuscript for it has been long lost. It's a play that has been passed down between different theater companies as an oral tradition, and every company that performs it only does so once, as the play itself is said to have powers. Alan is inspired by this exchange, a new plot element that he'll introduce into the locations, just like he did at the subway. The pre-show ritual will take place in the ballroom. Alan plots out that the play troupe will carry out this play not realizing that it's a summoning ritual, and they will become sacrifices for it. The ballroom is a fair ways into the hotel, but when he gets there, it's clear that this will be a key scene in the play. Here in the proper setting, he decides that the cult will be called the Cult of the Tree mirroring the real-life Cult of the Tree in Bright Falls led by the Koskala brothers, and an alternate version of his fictional Cult of the Word. 
But he needs more of the story. He needs more locations and plots. He finds the rehearsal area where inspiration strikes him again. The Ocean View Hotel itself will have a dark history full of murder, death, and suicide, where a real cult carried out a ritual to summon the devil himself. The origins of this oral tradition given roots in this haunted place. It's a new plot element to apply to other areas of the hotel. Changing the rehearsal area to the plot element reveals that things either got very serious very quick or the set designers for this play needed a raise because whatever they were being paid wasn't nearly enough. Applying the haunted plot element to the ballroom itself sets one hell of a mood as well. A version of his writer's room is on the stage. This is where the devil himself was supposed to appear to rewrite reality while God slept. Precisely what Scratch did with the manuscript for Return after he took over Alan. In the play, the devil was played by some celebrity who never took off his cult mask. He never broke character. Casey assumes that it means Alan Wake, but Ed doesn't actually know who they were, and their name was scratched out in all the posters. Casey pins Mr. Scratch as the actor, a being born to play the role of the devil. It's the last plot element that he needs, the antagonist, Scratch himself, the devil. Applying that plot element to the ballroom shows the aftermath of the play bodies and blood. They summoned the devil and the devil did what the devil does. Alan follows the trail of blood through the hotel, finding corpses all along the way. It takes him back to the entrance hall, where a new plot element reveals a bloody staircase up the hotel that wasn't accessible before. An echo of Alex Casey reveals that Scratch stayed at the hotel during production in room 666, of course. He wasn't much of a social butterfly and only left his room to act in the play. Outside room 666 are several bodies. It's hard to deny where Scratch called home for a while. Within, Alan can still feel Scratch's presence, an undeniable force of evil. Another idea comes to him. An echo of Alex Casey speaks of something new, a murder victim. A particular woman was killed during the climax of the play, the leading lady, the Grand Dame. She played the part of the writer's muse, claiming to have seen the original manuscript of this play from long ago. At the finale of the play, the devil would crash through the hotel all the way to her room in 108, where he would meet his muse. But it turns out, Scratch knew who this muse was. He had joined the play just to get to her specifically. Before Alan can learn more, Scratch attacks from the darkness in a terrifying display of rage and power, just like he did in the subway system. As is dictated in the play, the devil rampages through the hotel, chasing Alan and destroying everything in its path to get to him. This is a proper horror story, no hero armor. If Scratch does get his hands on Alan, he will experience a violent death. But his salvation comes at the end of the hall, in a brightly lit room that Scratch cannot follow him into. Room 108 is the finale of the play. Alan needs to go there, find out who this muse was, and why Scratch wanted her dead. At the room, an overlap starts to present. This will have implications for Saga Anderson in the real world. He needs to do something here to help her. But the muse is much more than just a fictional character in a play. In a tragedy that will later be told in Return, the real-life counterpart to the muse is old Cynthia Weaver. She sacrificed so much in her life to act as the Lady of the Light for Tom Zane to help Alan Wake. She had very little left for herself in the end, and in her old age, the lamp that Alan now holds as a tool against the darkness was all she had left of Tom. It was taken from her. She was defenseless against the dark presence and it got her, claimed her as another victim, a taken. In this fiction, the muse was drowned in a bathtub and beneath her body was a music record. Alan has completed this part of the draft, reached the finale of the play. And with that completion, the muse and the record vanish. They will be of importance to Saga Anderson when the time is right. For a brief time, Alan sees Saga again. She says something about the clicker, and he tells her that she has to find it. It can help them. Saga is trying to ask questions, but Alan is on a different wavelength. He's focused on Alice and stopping Scratch. Saga has very different interests in what he's doing. He tries to tell her about finding a manuscript called Return, about writing initiation, but Saga seems angry about something. Their brief exchange isn't fruitful, but at least the possibility of Saga Anderson getting the clicker exists. For now, Alan needs to focus on getting back to his apartment at Parliament Tower. With the murder story complete, it appears outside the hotel. Always, it will be the finale of each draft. Scratch's presence is more oppressive this time, though. Alan believes that Alice was tormented by him. The apartment now has far more from Alice's art exhibit laying around. The bathroom has been converted into a red room. There are poster boards ready to advertise it. 
On the kitchen counter is an old computer with emails from Barry Wheeler to Alice. After Alan vanished, he and Alice became friends and they stayed in touch. He looked in on her, helped her as best as he could, even though they were very different people. Their mutual care for Alan brought them together as friends. He went west some years after the incident and unknowingly got involved with the Blessed Organization, a secret paracriminal group that the FBC has been trying to hunt down. Eh, at least he seemed happy though. The VHS tapes from Alice chronicle her journey while she created the art exhibition. Remember, these tapes were created to push Alan along. The art exhibit wasn't real, it was a concept manufactured to motivate and guide Alan. In the tapes, it becomes clear that she was no longer afraid of the dark. She wasn't afraid of the hauntings or Alan. She says that the more she photographed, the more she felt on the verge of a breakthrough. But for all her work and searching, she didn't know what she was looking for. But she was hell-bent on proving that these things that she saw in the darkness were real. Draft 2 of Initiation is now complete. Alan returns to his writer's room to see what happens next. Last time he was here, he found himself dead in the chair with a bullet wound in his forehead. A copy of the manuscript return on the table with scribbles on the title page. This time, though, the room is empty. The full manuscript of the novel Return is next to the typewriter, with no edits on it. He reads through it, and he slowly comes to understand that it was written by Scratch, not him. It ends with the Dark Presence escaping from the Dark Place. He has to do something. He has to stop this story from coming true. If he completes Initiation, then Return will come true, and Scratch will be unleashed onto the world. He had to edit Return. He had to change the main character, Alex Casey, into the FBI agent Saga Anderson. He had to work within the constraints of the story. It would remain a horror story. There had to be death, sacrifices, pain, and terror. Alan worked through his edits, but before he reached the end, he walked into the room. It's him from another point in the spiral. His hair is soaking wet. He is holding a gun with a look of rage on his face. It is not Scratch, but the entity is near. This enraged Alan walks up to himself, and he shoots the writing Alan in the head. But what would push Alan to that point, to be so irrationally violent, so angered? Well, let's find out. Alan awakens again in his writer's room. Initiation draft 2 was a failure. The story needs to be changed again. He believes it was Scratch that shot him to stop him from finishing his edits on return. His memory of the edits was already fading, though. He may have lost his chance to complete the edits. Alan knows that Zane lied to him. Scratch wrote Return, and he knew it. He needs to go have a talk with the filmmaker. Initiation always started in the TV studio, included a murder site, and ended at Parliament Tower. Zane would answer his questions and tell him where the next murder site was. When he comes to, he's of course back in the TV studio, but it's flooding now, and his hair is soaking wet. There's no happy segment intros playing on the TV from Moreland Door. It's a very somber mood. The set itself is dark. In previous drafts, there were boisterous interviews or musical numbers, but Warland Dorr is waiting for him in the dark, and he is none too pleased. He's done indulging Wake in this TV show nonsense. Alan has written Saga Anderson into the story, his daughter, and he's pissed. We know why. We know what Alan has been doing. We know more than the writer himself does at this point. So let's just let Dorr himself express his displeasure and just take it all in. I don't have time for this, so let's get over with. Tell me, was this all fake? A show? No one said otherwise, Mr. Wake. It was to indulge you, but we can start pretending now. Uh, masks come off. Oh, I wouldn't go that far. I don't even think you know who's under your mask, but you know how to make things difficult for yourself. All these rules, endless, convoluted loops you insist on going through. You are so lucky, you know. There are so many people helping you. Armies of people. Myself. Your wife. Alice. I need to get to her. She's in danger. She is. Because of you. And so is someone important to me, someone you pulled into this. You keep opening doors, peeking in, 
reaching through to get what you want, and that puts you in my path. I don't know what you're talking about. I have to go now. Maybe you will make it through this time. This has gone on long enough. This and our night springs, it was a nice distraction. It's time someone gave me a straight answer here. The next time we meet, the circumstances will be very different. And you would do well to return the favor by playing your part. Or stay out of my way, Mr. Wake. Well, I sure as hell wouldn't want to be on his bad side. When the conversation ends, Alan is alone on the stage once again. The building is still flooded, and there are shadows backstage that he has to contend with. It's dark as hell, but there too is a helper here, Audie. He provides his words of comfort and wisdom, a grounding presence amidst the chaos that Alan has surrounded himself with. Audie tells Alan that while Dor is displeased with him, Dor will allow the master of this reality, Alan Wake, to continue on and he will play his role as needed. Then he drops little clues for Alan. Seems that Tom put Audie into his films. He's excited to know if You and You, his most famous film, is maybe coming back to the cinemas. Hint hint, nudge nudge. Apparently, in a different part of the spiral, Alan entrusted Audie with photos that Alice had taken, to be delivered to him at a proper time. They're in that shoebox down in the basement. The photos Audie has been safekeeping are of the clicker, sinking into the darkness with a hand outstretched to grab it, and a bullet of light. He senses that they'll be important, but he doesn't know what to do with them yet. Outside the studio, the payphone does not ring, and Alan doesn't need directions. He knows exactly where Zane is. At the Ocean View Hotel, he goes straight there and up to room 665. He takes control of the scene upon arrival, tying Zane to a chair and holding him at gunpoint. And this is important because it indicates that Alan can actively control his environment on a whim. Though he's not very good at it yet, that control is weak. He confronts Zane with the truth. Scratch wrote return, and he helped him. But Zane pleads that he didn't have a choice. Alan had given up writing, and when Scratch showed up offering to help Zane escape, he had no other options. He wants to get the hell out of this place so badly, and Scratch's work was absolutely magnificent. But when he finished his writing, he left Zane behind. He begs Alan to get return before Scratch does, and uses Alice to conjure up a sense of urgency with the request. Zane tells Alan that when he finds Scratch, to not hesitate in killing him. The next murder site is at Zane's cinema nearby, where Yutengu is playing. And while Wake's guard is down, Zane starts enacting his own dramatic art. He starts exerting his own presence against Alan, trying to take back control of the situation. They switch spots, they change roles, they fight for control over the scene, and Alan shoots Zane in the head. From the dead man's pocket, Wake takes a theater ticket, which will get him into the cinema, and then he departs from the projector. But Tom Zane, that dark doppelganger of the long-lost poet, ever the schemer, will use this dramatic scene of violence and betrayal for himself. After all, he's trying to escape too, and what played out was a very suspenseful scene befitting his own art. He'll have to seek out other avenues of escape beyond Alan Wake himself. The cinema isn't far off. Bright searchlights guide his way there. It's a bit of a hassle reaching it, but once he makes it to the front booth, that ticket he took from Zane's pocket gets him inside. An echo of Alex Casey recounts how he feels like he's been searching for this cult of the word for an entire lifetime at this point. Countless incidents of violence that lead nowhere, but this theater, it felt different. The same rules of progression apply here as in the other drafts. Find locations, unlock plot elements through inspiration, and change the scenes to progress the story. In a back room of the lobby, an echo reveals more of the story. Ilmo Koskala plays a part in the story as a fictional cultist. He tells Alex Casey that what was to happen here was a ceremony involving two of NYPD's finest who were working for the cult, the same two officers who had appeared in the other drafts. But he won't say who their leader is or what they were planning. This inspires Alan to use another plot element involving the two cops, New York's finest. This scene changes to open up the theater, where Yu and Yu is soon to begin. But where is the film itself? Another echo reveals Casey and the cultists exchanging taunts over it. Somewhere within the theater is a clip of the film, something integral to the overall plot of this story. According to the cultist, Alex Casey is a part of a ritual taking place here, playing a part like a puppet blindly performing. The answers that Casey seeks are within the film, so Alan needs to find it. 
He can change the theater scene and segments of it will play out on the scene, but not the entire clip. That won't come until the very end. The character on the screen, Zane, he freezes at a key point in the plot, holding up his unlit lamp, and there's no other paths that Alan can take, so he sends one of his lights into Zane's lamp, revealing a previously non-existent door. Remember, dream logic. It takes him out into an alley and up the side of a building where, in fiction, Alex Casey chases down the cultist played by Ilmo Koskala. When the two characters had their final confrontation at the ledge of a fire escape, Alex Casey asked how. How did they get him into the film Mutant You without him remembering? The cultist says that now that he's seen it, he is ready to meet their grand master in the projection booth, where he will project a new reality into this one. And then the cultist throws himself from the side of the building to his death. Back on the ground, he finds another Echo, the two officers. They were convinced that they were going to be initiated into the cult, unaware that the grand master had far darker plans for the two stooges. Back in the main theater room, Alan changes the plot element to the final part, the Grand Master, and a door on the screen is revealed. It's the only way to reach the projection booth, and once he's in, there's no going back. It's a maze of film equipment, devoid of color save grayscale and red, and Alan can feel right away that he's not alone in the maze. He can hear the angry yells of Alex Casey as he goes, taunting the Grand Master he was searching for in the original work of fiction that Alan has usurped his place in. Past a few doors, Alan discovers that he's in a loop of this film maze. It's a loop within a loop. But there are slight changes. Alex Casey calls out in anger again, but another version of Casey hears the yelling and he responds to it. It's Casey yelling at Casey. Then the loop begins again, but this time it's Casey yelling at Casey, who's also yelling at Casey, while what looks like Casey is tied to a chair. But the tied-up Casey vanishes when Alan gets near. Before he can enter the next loop, he finds a VHS tape of himself in the writer's room, having a manic episode that he doesn't remember. He had been trying to create Return, but it was always wrong. It didn't work as a piece of art or fiction. He was missing something. A step before Return, the second of the trilogy, he had to create Initiation. He was doing things all out of order, yet still trying to follow his own literary rules. It was maddening to try to make sense of. At the next loop, he hears Casey yelling at Casey, who's also yelling at Casey, while another Casey yells too, while the actor who plays Casey is revealed to be the man tied to the chair. It's fiction within fiction, and if it doesn't make sense, that's okay. There's not a lot of sense to be made here. It's dream logic, remember. The actor says that Alan doesn't have to kill him. He doesn't have to go get that knife over there and stab him. He doesn't have to ritualistically sacrifice him to open the way forward. It's almost like he wants to be stabbed. So Alan goes to get the knife and he walks back, totally not going to stab him, by the way. He's just holding it. But the actor breaks free from the chair and he bolts through the exit door. And Alan follows, not to stab him, but you know, just to progress the story, not commit a murder. This finally leads to the end of the loop. An overlap is revealed, a place where Saga Anderson will walk during her own adventures. She'll need something that Alan has in the dark place. Completing this part of the story will have it delivered to her. But what could it be? Last time at the Ocean View Hotel, it was a strange music record. Another echo reveals another part of the Alex Casey story. A cultist tells the detective that he is a part of this story, that he is a fictional character within a book and he's brought the writer of that story here to them. Casey has a complete existential crisis from this revelation, demanding to know how he was in you and you, why this all feels familiar, and who he himself is. His part in the story ends before he gets those answers. The character Alex Casey is discarded. Instead, it is Alan Wake who will go on to the finale of the writing. The supposed grandmaster of the cult welcomes Alan Wake and promises that he is just one step away from his final destination. He's faced with a parting question from the grandmaster. Whose story are you living, Mr. Wake? This part of the story is nearly complete. Time to see what's in the projection booth. It is the heart of the overlap, the murder site that he has been looking for. The two NYPD officers were the victims of it. It's a heartless and macabre display. The two of them are strung up with film reel, one of them wearing a moose skull on his head. He sees a flash of something from the real world. The skull, the mask, it is a key. Saga Anderson will need it for something, and he fully realizes that now. He turns to see Saga Anderson once again, not knowing that their timelines don't match up. 
The saga that he's meeting now is from a time earlier in her day. He tries to tell her about Return and Scratch in the edits, about the manuscript being the key to his escape, but she doesn't understand. What does he mean, escape, and who the hell is Scratch? He says he wrote her into the story to be the hero, and that she can save her family as the hero if she keeps going, which Saga sharply responds to with angry confusion. But they're just not communicating well enough, their messages are disjointed, and the overlap fades before they can make sense of each other. It's time to go back to Parliament Tower one more time. He needs to finish initiation. And Alice Wake herself has something horrific that Alan must experience to push him farther along this path. On his way out, he can hang out in the theater to watch Yoot and Yu, the accompanying piece of art to go with Return that Zane had created, his contribution and attempt to escape. It's a mind bender, but worth the view, especially for the finale. Then it's off to Parliament Tower. There's one final echo from Alex Casey for him to see, a finale for the character who heads out into the city to face the next mystery, the next crime, the next horror. There's one more chance to track down Tim Breaker, chat about aliens, missing time, Mr. Door, his theories on everything going on here. He's in good spirits and has adjusted well to this weird reality. Outside Parliament Tower, the statue of Alan Wake has been replaced by one of Alice Wake, and that payphone was ringing. It would be pretty damn bold of Zane to be calling again, but when Alan picks it up, he hears himself on the other end. He's calling himself from a different point in the spiral, one that, sadly, we never get to see, which just sends my lore thought senses into a complete tizzy. But the other Alan tells our present Alan that he will get out, and no, he won't get out. Both are true, but it's by his own choice, if that's of any comfort. Other Alan tells him that he needs to put the pictures that he got from the basement of the TV studio, remember the picture of the clicker and that bullet of light, he needs to put them into a shoebox that is going to appear right now at the base of Alice Wake's statue. They'll be needed later by others who currently are and who will be in the dark place. With this complete, Alan can return to his home to see what awaits him in the tower. On the elevator ride up, he remarks that somehow things feel different this time. When he arrives, there are no camera flashes, no furniture, no sign that anyone even lives here. It's dead quiet, save the snarling of some unseen creature in the living area. A projector is set up, ready to play Alice Wake's final prepared video. It's her goodbye. She's given up. The loss was too great, the hauntings too severe, and she couldn't keep going. She was instead going to become part of the art herself. It was time for a perspective shift, as she says. An addendum at the end notes that shortly after this, Alice took her own life and photographed her final steps. The images are of her on a high cliff overlooking what seems to be a caldera, Cauldron Lake in truth. She walks towards the edge and plunges into the unknown below. And this is pure grief, it's shock and horror to Alan. His greatest worry has been for his wife, keeping her safe from scratch and all this time she'd been dead? and he blames Scratch for it. He believes that Scratch was the one haunting her, tormenting her. He has returned to the writer's room, completely overtaken by unreasoning rage. There's someone sitting at the desk, working. It must be Scratch writing Return. He had just been on the other side of the scenario, when he found the manuscript for Return, and he was handwriting the edits to include Saga Anderson, edits to stop Scratch from escaping. This is what had caused wet-haired Alan to shoot himself in the head to stop himself from finishing the edits to return. The belief that the man in the chair was Scratch and he was going to kill him, just like Zane had said, when you find Scratch, don't hesitate to kill him, and Alan doesn't. But in the aftermath of the killing, the wet-haired Alan realizes his mistake. He remembers being shot in this way, by himself. He remembers and he realizes that he had been the one haunting Alice. He can't just blame everything on Scratch. He bears responsibility for all of this. He played a part in Alice's despair and her death. And in this broken state, he can't fight off the dark presence. It, Scratch, enters into Alan to prepare for the next step, which they will take together. At this point, the edited pages of Return are placed into the real world, placed earlier in Saga Anderson's timeline so that she will have them to guide her through Bright Falls and Cauldron Lake. Alan Wake himself will also be sent to the real world, but to another point in the real world time. We return to Saga. She has just defeated Nightingale. We now know how all those manuscript pages appeared to guide her. And before her on the shores of Cauldron Lake, Alan Wake has appeared. 
He's just finished the third draft of initiation, witnessed the horrific death of his wife, shot himself in the head in the dark place, and he's unwittingly carrying a very special guest within himself. He will forget the events of the dark place, so it's a bit of a Trojan horse situation we have here. Alan Wake is here because of a ritual that was performed to pull him through, but it's a ritual that is performed in the future. He didn't arrive when he was expected to, it seems. And I hope you got all that, because next time, we're putting it all together. From what I gathered, you grew up nice and sheltered with mama's pretty stories and your own made up fury. And mama gave me a magic clicker. Well, yes, I think it's true and fair to say. Come on in the listen. Clicker, I chase.